Welcome to the New Heights Show on Education. I'm Pamela Clark, founder and director of the New Heights Educational Group. And I'm here with David Smith, the founder of Silicon Valley High School, who has helped us get these podcasts produced and delivered to you. Yes, Pamela, when we saw the great things that you and your army of volunteers were achieving at New Heights, we wanted to get involved. We're happy to work with you to leverage the internet and make quality education accessible and affordable to everyone, everywhere. Thank you, David. We appreciate Silicon Valley High School helping us to get these podcasts out to the hundreds of thousands of listeners from all over the world. So I hope you enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome to the first edition of my show on civil rights. My name is Barbara Bullen, and I'm one of the radio hosts for the New Heights Show on Education and the New Heights Educational Group. This show is pre-recorded. I would like my listeners to know that this is the first time I'm hosting a radio show. In the past, I've been a mediator and an author, then ventured into the entertainment business as a screenplay writer, script writer, screenplay analyst, playwright, educational writer, and now radio host. I'm so happy to have been selected to host my own radio show on civil rights which will help my listeners to be educated about the past, to look forward to the accomplishments of the present. Some of you may be unhappy with the news of today's events, but we have come a long way from the past. Voices are heard, although some people may feel that they've fallen deaf ears, but with the combined efforts of interested parties, we can and will make a change in the lives of those who need us. New Heights Educational Group is the way to go to seek educational training and resources as they benefit children, teens and adults. I chose to volunteer with New Heights because of their reputation, one of the best, and they have not proven me wrong. Today's show focuses on the history of slavery in the United States. In the 1500s, slaves were brought from Africa to the United States during the colonial era by the British and the white Americans. They were considered property, chattel to be bought, sold, or given away. Laws to prohibit slavery did not exist until 1865, the abolishment of slavery. The 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution states in Section 1, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States, or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Section 2. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. After reading and conducting research about slavery, I decided to write two poems especially for this show. The first is called Slavery. Slaves were brought from Africa to walk to walk the farmers' plantations on their land that the white and sometimes African men held. They were not breaking the law, for the 13th Amendment was not law until 1865, because ending slavery would have interfered with their world. Slaves came in all different races, from the white Europeans to the Chinese, and the Africans, like the white European slaves, were brought to this foreign land, shackled hand and feet. Although the European slaves suffered unknown cruelty, like the Africans, the similarity ends because they couldn't understand a word of English. The Declaration of Independence stated the wishes of the states who were subjected to British rule, yet the states practiced horrific crimes on the slaves that they brought so far away from their land. Their fear of being killed in a foreign land with no family or friends terrified them. Many were beaten, tortured, and lost their lives for the greed of white and sometimes African mankind. Shackled by the fear and mistrust of them who treated them like chattel, today we, like the slaves, are shackled to a history of abuse. Despite the laws enacted to protect us, slavery still exists. When is man going to see that slavery must be stopped? because there must be another way after hundreds of years to put an end to it. The United States was not the only country who was guilty of slavery. 
Europeans in Brazil, the Caribbean, and Southwest Asia participated in the kidnapping or the capture of Africans to work the plantations and farms because of the need for cheap labor. As England's presence in the Americas grew, it came to dominate the Atlantic slave trade. From 1690 until England abolished the slave trade in 1807, it was the leading carrier of enslaved Africans. By the time slave trade ended, the English had transported nearly 1.7 million Africans to their colonians, to their colonies in the West Indies. African slaves were also brought to what is now the United States. In all, nearly 400,000 Africans were sold to Britain's North American colonies. Once in North America, however, the slave population grew. By 1830, roughly 2 million slaves told the United States. That was taken from the Atlantic slave trade, SPS 186.org. Africans who were put on ships bound for the United States suffered horrific and gruesome cruelty in which they were shackled to beams, some tortured and mutilated, and some died from malnutrition and starvation. Upon arrival, they were offloaded, shackled and forced upon auction blocks where the highest bidder would be able to purchase a slave or slaves for their plantations, field or farms. The Africans' horror did not end there. They were forced to communicate in their language. With the inability to understand their slave masters, they were beaten into submission or forced to understand what was being said to them. They were then put to work from early morning to dusk or night in order to fulfill the needs of their slave masters. If they failed to produce the output that they required, they were beaten, tortured, or killed. Branding was also used on slaves who were tempted or captured by their slave masters. In Louisiana, there was a black code or black or code noir, which, which allowed the cropping of ears, shoulder branding, and hamstringing the cutting of tendons near the knee as punishments for recaptured slaves. Slave owners used extreme punishment to stop flight or escape. They would often brand the slaves' palms, shoulders, buttocks, or cheeks with a branding iron. Branding was sometimes used to mark recaptured runaway slaves to help the locals easily identify the runaway. Mikaja Ricks, a slave owner in Raleigh, North Carolina, was looking for his slave and described, I burned her with a hot iron on the left side of her face. I tried to make the letter M. Most slave owners would use whipping as their main method, but at other times they would use branding to punish their slaves. Another testimony explains how a slave owner in Kentucky around 1848 was looking for his runaway slave. He described her having a brand mark on the breast, something like L blotched. In South Carolina, there were many laws which permitted the punishment slaves would receive. When a slave ran away, if it was the first offense, the slave would receive no more than 40 lashes. Then the second offense would be branding. The slave would have been marked with the letter R on their forehead, signifying that they were a criminal and a runaway. An excerpt taken from Wikipedia. The second poem I wrote is called Branding. Branding a slave as punishment from fleeing or recapture as a sin, because the slave master feels slaves are his property to do as his will. Slaves are human beings, they smell, see, hear and feel. They have blood that runs through their veins, so are human, just like them. And when the slaves have had enough, it's time for them to flee, only to be branded again by the slave masters for, incapa for incapacity. Slaves have endured horrific cruel cruelty despite their origin, but the African slaves' horror never ended, not then and not now, until equality and peace is sustained. Right now, you might be struggling through your classes or even failing them. You might be worried that you may not finish high school. There might have even been a thought that you may not be smart enough. Well, the New Heights Educational Group begs to differ. We not only think you are smart enough, but with our help, you will complete your high school diploma. The New Heights Educational Group strives to improve your academic success through its tutoring services. To learn more, please visit newheightseducation.org and contact us. New Heights Educational Group, educational resources to help reach your goals.
This podcast is brought to you by Silicon Valley High School, the world's fastest growing, video based, self paced, teacher supported, fully accredited online school that's recommended by more than 96% of students. Take individual courses at just $95 each or earn your high school diploma at any age. Check us out at svhs.co. Welcome back to the New Heights Show on Education. My name is Barbara Bullen and I'm the radio host for the show. This show is pre-recorded and focuses on the history of civil rights. A recap of the first segment of the show on slavery will continue with the most influential with the most influential documents that govern the United States. I will continue the discussion from the last radio show on slavery, starting with the transatlantic slave trade. In 1500, slavery was said to occur in West Africa with the Europeans. Their discovery of such a new land and the opportunities that it could afford, including slaves for its colonies in in the Caribbean, South and North America, where its plantations that consisted of sugar and other crops were said to be desirable as commodities that would bring in badly needed resources and monetary reward. Slaves were usually captured by African tribes in raids or open warfare or purchased from other African tribes. Many tribes were happy to get rid of their enemies by capturing and selling them for trade goods, usually whiskey, swords, guns and gold. It is believed that about 11 million men, women and children were transported in ships across the Atlantic to various ports in the Americas, mostly to Brazil and the islands in the Caribbean from 1500 to 1850. 400 years ago in 1607, Jamestown, Virginia, the first permanent settlement by Europeans in North America was founded. In 1610, John Rolfe, introduced a strain of tobacco, which quickly became the colony's economic foundation. By 1619, more labor was needed to support the tobacco trade and indentured servants were brought to the colony, including about 20 Africans. As of 1650, there were about 300 Africans living in Virginia, about 1% of an estimated 30,000 population. They were still not slaves, and they joined approximately 4,000 white indentured servants working out their loans for passage money to Virginia. They were granted 50 acres each when freed from their indentures so they could raise their own tobacco. Slavery was brought to North America in 1654 when Anthony Johnson in Northampton County convinced the court that he was entitled to the lifetime services of John Kayser, a black man. This was the first judicial approval of life servitude, except as punishment for a crime. Anthony Johnson was a black man, one of the original 20 brought to Jamestown in 1619. By 1623, he had achieved his freedom and by 1651 was prosperous enough to import five servants of his own, for which he was granted 250 acres as head rights an excerpt from Slavery in North America, 1654 to June the 19, 1865, wesleyan.edu. Slavery lasted in about half of the United States states until 1865. As an economic system, slavery was largely re- replaced by sharecropping and convict leasing. By the time of the American Revolution, 1775 to 1783, the status of enslaved people had been institutionalized as a racial caste associated with African ancestry. During and immediately following the revolution, abolitionist laws were passed in most northern states and a movement developed to abolish slavery. An excerpt from Wikipedia. Although anti-slavery northerners began passing abolition laws beginning with the 1777 state's constitution of Vermont, northern slavery did not recede quickly. By 1810, a generation after the revolution, over one-fourth of all northern African Americans were still enslaved. 
but by 1840 slavery had almost completely disappeared. While slavery was far less entrenched than in the South, Northern abolitionists still had to legally dismantle the institution. State abolition laws proved their most potent weapon. Pennsylvania, the second most populous state in the late 18th century, gave birth to the first anti-slavery so society and the first state abolition act. Taken from abolitionseminar.org. All northern states had abolished slavery in some way by 1805. Sometimes abolition was a gradual process and hundreds of people were still enslaved in the northern states as late as the 1840 census. Some slave owners, primarily in the Upper South, freed their slaves and philanthropists and charitable groups bought, bought and freed others. The Atlantic slave trade was outlawed by individual states beginning during the American Revolution. The import trade was banned by Congress in 1808, although smuggling was common thereafter. An excerpt from Wikipedia. The rapid expansion of the cotton industry in the Deep South after the invention of the cotton gin greatly increased demand for slave labor and the southern states continued as slave societies. The United States became even more polarized over the issue of slavery split into slave and free states. Driven by labor demand from new cotton plantations in the Deep South, the Upper South sold more than a million slaves who were taken to the Deep South. The total slave population in the South eventually reached four million. As the United States expanded, the southern states attempted to extend slavery into the new western territories to allow pro-slavery forces to maintain their power in the country. The new territories acquired by the Louisiana Purchase and the Mexican Cession were the subject of major political crisis and compromises. By 1850, the newly rich cotton-growing South was threatening to secede from the Union, and tensions continued to rise. Slavery was defended in the South as a positive good, and the largest religious denominations split over the slavery issue into regional organizations of the North and South. An excerpt from Wikipedia. The United States became independent of British rule on July the 4th, 1776. According to the book, The Meaning of the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence was signed by representatives of the 13 colonies with no system of national government, so the Second Continental Congress assembled to form one. The Congress elected a committee of 12 men to draw up a system of government and the committee wrote the Articles of Confederation. After considerable debate and alteration, the Articles of Confederation were adopted by the Continental Congress on November the 15th, 1777. This document served as the United States' first constitution and was enforced from March 1st, 1781 until 1789 when the present day constitution went into effect. Artdocuments.gov The Continental Congress adopted the Articles of Confederation, the first constitution of the United States on November the 15th, 1777. However, ratification of the Articles of Confederation by all 13 states did not occur until March 1st, 1781. The Articles created a loose confederation of sovereign states and a weak central government, leaving most of the power with the state governments. The need for a stronger federal government soon became apparent and eventually led to the Constitutional Convention in 1787. The present United States Constitution replaced the Articles of Confederation on the March 4, 1789. LOC.gov excerpt. The United States Constitution brought together in one remarkable document ideas for many people and several existing documents, including the Articles of Confederation and Declaration of Independence. Those who made significant intellectual contributions to the Constitution are called the Founding Fathers of our country excerpt from constitutionfacts.com. 
The founding fathers of the United States included George Washington, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Thomas Paine, and Patrick Henry. An article called The Founding Fathers and Slavery by Anthony Lacarino states, in his initial draft of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson condemned the injustice of the slave trade and by implication slavery, but he also blamed the presence of enslaved Africans in North America on a, ver on a vericus British colony policies. Jefferson thus acknowledged that slavery violated the natural rights of the enslaved, while at the same time he absolved Americans of any responsibility for owning slaves themselves. The Continental Congress apparently rejected the tortured logic of this passage by deleting it from the final document, but this decision also signaled the founders' commitment to subordinating the controversial issue of slavery to the larger goal of securing the unity and independence of the United States. Nevertheless, the founders, with the exception of those from South Carolina and Georgia, exhibited considerable aversion to slavery during the era of the Articles of Confederation, 1781 to 89, by prohibiting the importation of foreign slaves to individual states and lending their support to a proposal by Jefferson to ban slavery in the Northwest ter Territory. Such anti-slavery policies, however, only went so far. The prohibition of foreign slave imports by limiting the foreign supply conveniently served the interests of Virginia and Maryland slaveholders who could then sell their own surplus slaves southward and westward at higher prices. Furthermore, the ban on slavery in the Northwest tactically legitimated the expansion of slavery in the Southwest. The Articles of Confederation 1777 to 1781 served as the written document that established the functions of the national government of the United States after it declared independence from Great Britain. It established a weak central government that mostly, but not, but not entirely, prevented the individual states from conducting their own foreign policy. Taken from Office of the Historian, history.state.gov. The, the slaveholders among prominent founding fathers who held slaves included Charles Carroll from Maryland, Samuel Chase from Maryland, Benjamin Franklin from Pennsylvania, Budden Gwinnett from Georgia, John Hancock from Massachusetts, Patrick Henry from Virginia, John Jay from New York, Thomas Jeff Jefferson from Virginia, Richard Henry Lee, Virginia, James Madison, Virginia, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney from South Carolina, Benjamin Rush from Pennsylvania, Edward Rutledge from South Carolina, George Washington from Virginia. Non-slaveholders or founding fathers was John Adams from Massachusetts, Samuel Adams from Massachusetts, Oliver Ellsworth from Connecticut, Alexander Hamilton from New York, Robert Treat Payne from Massachusetts, Thomas Payne from Pennsylvania, Roger Sherman from Connecticut, taken from Britannia.com. This comes to the conclusion of the show. Thank you for listening. You can reach me by email barbara b at newheightseducation.org. Be sure to join me every Sunday at radio.newheightseducation.org as I discuss the history of civil rights. Also join Olaine Yan Tabat's pre-recorded radio show, which airs by Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and Pamela Clark's pre-recorded shows, which airs Wednesday by 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We hope you enjoyed today's show. Don't forget to rate us and follow us on your podcast player. Check out our show page, radio.newheightseducation.org, for monthly announcements and other happenings.